Hello and welcome to the Streams of Winter. I'm Yoke Boy and we are Radio Westeros. Thanks so much to all of you for tuning in to our live stream this afternoon. Sorry about the short delay. We had a shadow ghost thingy tech problem. We don't know where it came from. But today we'll be talking all about a character who initially entered the story as a trembling coward at Castle Black, but has grown to be one of the story's unlikely heroes. Give it up for everyone's favorite bookworm, it's Samuel Tarly. In Feast, we journey south with, that, with Sam to Bravos and then Old Town on a mission to study at the Citadel and eventually replace Maester Eamon as the Maester at the Wall. So how did Sam's backstory as a mistreated son of Randall Tarly shape his character? What will Sam learn at the Citadel and how will he get along with his fellows? And what about those fellow novices? How are they, how are they really and what do they want? And how will Sam protect Gilly and the baby given the danger surrounding Old Town? Yeah, there's Euron in the Red Wine Straits, remember? These are huge questions. And so to help me answer, here's the other half of Radio Westeros, Lady Gwyn. Hello. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Streams of Winter. We're very happy to be back talking about Sam. And uh, to join us... We've been waiting for this for a long time. We talked about this many, many moons ago the, for the first time. Uh, we're very happy to welcome back Joe Magician coming straight over from his own channel. Uh, we do appreciate his dedication to live streaming today. Welcome. Yeah, uh, you guys asked me a while ago. You were like, oh, what what POV do you want to do next? I'm like, Samwell. And I think you guys were both like, what? <laughs> why, why Sam? <laughs> And I think that's kind of a common reaction to Samwell. I, I thought as a POV, I think a lot of people like him as a character, but they don't enjoy his chapters very much. Like they don't rise to the top of the rankings when it's like, oh, what's your favorite? And I think part of that is what you were talking about, that Sam, I think, hits a little bit too close to home for people, like especially within the Song of Ice and Fire fandom. A lot of us probably grew up being bullied, being awkward nerds who love books and stuff like that. So when you read Sam, like a little bit of the fantasy is broken. But that I think that's the part I really like about him. And um, yeah, I came from my own live stream today. I just finished two hours of streaming about the faceless men and only the faceless men. <laughs> that was that was quite a lot. I got my tea ready here. So hopefully my voice doesn't break and I'm a little wired, but I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. We are. It may be only about another 15 minutes about faceless men. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Topical actually. We'll come to that. <laughs> I didn't plan it. It just happened. It just happened that way. All right. Well, yo boy, why don't you uh, tee us up? Take yeah, us away. Without, without further ado, let's get our teeth into this one. <clears throat> so my first question for you guys in the final chapter of A Feast for Crows, Sam arrives at the Citadel as a member of the Night's Watch, bringing news of a number of supernatural events, the others, the undead and dragons. So how would this news be received by the Archmaesters of the Citadel? Lady Gwyn, why don't you take it away? Well, I am going to um, just really set the tone here uh, with some notes um, to start us off. Uh, so... Marwin has been pretty explicit to Sam about this topic. At least he's said many words uh, or words have been said to Sam about things that uh, Marwin might have done or thinks. So when Sam first meets Alaris, uh, Alaris says uh, Theobald will not believe half of that after hearing his Sam's story. But there are those who might. And once Marwin hears the story, uh, and all about Eamon, he says, perhaps it's a good thing Eamon died before he got to Old Town. Elsewise, the gray sheep might have had to kill him, and that would have made the poor old deers wring their wrinkled hands. So we're painting a picture of, you know, maesters uh, being fairly disbelieving. Marwin continues, and if I tell you, they may need to kill you too. Who do you think killed all the dragons the last time around? Callant dragon slayers armed with swords? The world the Citadel is building has no place in it for sorcery or prophecy or glass candles, much less for dragons. Ask yourself why Aemon Targaryen was allowed to waste his life upon the wall when by rights he should have been raised to Archmaester. His blood was why. He could not be trusted no more than I can. So what do we think of this stuff? Is, um, is Marwyn, you know, being, being just up front with Sam or uh, is there more to it? So I recently 
did a stream about Marwin. This is like this is all coming together like one big plan. <laughs> I talked I did a whole one about Marwin too. And as a big part of that, I laid out that um obviously on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Joe Magician. Um <laughs> I per, I have a really hard time believing Marwin here because it this is not our first introduction to the Maesters. We know other Maesters in the story, and they all pretty much even Lewin who has studied it have very skeptical views of magic in the world but you know they're mostly nerds and they bury their nose in books and learning and that's they don't see much beyond that if anything they would probably require a lot of proof from Sam about his claims about the others and the army of the dead and stuff like that but that's that's pretty reasonable his tale is extraordinary and as good scholars they would require extraordinary proof why would that mean he would be murdered that seems like an exaggeration here from Marwin. Like, for instance, when you look at Maester Cresson, he does attempt to kill Melisandre for her role, but it's not for being magical. It's because she's trying to make Stannis and Renly kill each other, his surrogate sons. He really cares about them. Like, for instance, I don't think if a Maester encounters a Shadowbinder, they turn into a Terminator, and they all of a sudden have to kill them right now. <laughs> Magic, oh my god, punch him out, like something <laughs> like that. I don't think that's what's going on. <laughs> and another part of his claim is that the Citadel has no taste for magic and find it in anyone who practices it dangerous. You know, perhaps dangerous enough to, to kill. However, Marwin is the living counterexample. He is the leading cheerleader on all these topics in the Citadel and honestly in the story. And we know that the Citadel will cast out maesters for straying too far into forbidden topics like Kyber. But they find Marwin so dangerous after his return from the doom city of Ashai, that they promote him to Archmaester of the Higher Mysteries. The man literally has a glass candle lit in his office. If his beliefs and ideas were truly so dangerous that they threatened the Citadel, why has he not been given the Kyburn treatment and kicked out? They supposedly promoted Marwin as high as he can be before becoming Grand Maester, and yet, according to him, they are paradoxically on the verge of killing him at any second. I have no doubt that the Citadel members will be very skeptical of Sam's story based on lack of evidence, but killing him, I, I don't really see it. Yeah, I don't want to, yeah, just to run with that for a minute. Yeah, as you said, Marwin's ring and rod and mask are Valyrian steel. That signifies he's the most expert person at the Citadel in the study of higher mysteries. And if you're wondering exactly what higher mysteries means, um, we can. We got it right from the mouth of Maester Lewin, uh, who has a Valyrian steel link, tells Bran, only one maester in a hundred wears such a link. This signifies that I have studied what the Citadel calls the higher mysteries. Magic, for want of a better word. A fascinating pursuit, but of small use, which is why so few maesters trouble themselves with it. But obviously enough do that the Citadel feels that they have to keep an archmaester on hand to facilitate that study. And then Lewin continues, all those who study the higher mysteries try their own hand at spells soon or late. I yielded to the temptation too, I must confess. Well, I was a boy and what boy does not secretly wish to find hidden powers in himself. I got no more for my efforts than a thousand boys before me and a thousand since. Sad to say, magic does not work. So Lewin is a doubter or a, um, you know, he's pretty much uh, feels magic doesn't work. But it seems like like him, most of the rest of the Citadel views magic as a theory, uh, something that can be studied, maybe comparable to the way alchemy was viewed in medieval universities. It was an expression of a rational philosophy. It was proto-science. Scholars used it to study. Um, use the study of alchemy in an attempt to untangle the mysteries of history and the natural world. And so this, thus you get Lewin's assertion that magic is a fascinating pursuit because it's part of that effort to untangle things that are unexplained uh, by other types of science that they have available to them at this point. So the question is, why Marwin would put it quite that way to Sam. And I guess the answer would have to be in order to keep him kind of quiet, you know, in order to keep Sam from talking to other maesters or, or telling his story far and wide as he's been instructed to do. Marwin is trying to control the narrative. You buy it? <laughs> yeah. Very interesting thoughts from both of you. Comprehensive answers. I really like the idea that 
Marwin is trying to control the narrative as much as he can, given that he's off to the dock so quickly. So on to the next question. Archmaester Marwin alone seems to believe the story and appears to have been expecting Samwell sending Alaraz to find him at the Seneschal's court. So does Marwin have some sort of agenda for Sam? What do you think, Lady Gwen? Well, I mean, it certainly seems like it. He's clearly waiting for Sam. After he leaves, Alaraz says to Sam, I have a confession. Ours was no chance encounter, Sam. The mage sent me to snatch you up before you spoke to Theobald. He knew that you were coming. And uh, Alaris indicates also that the glass candle was responsible for that. He's kind of like, eh, this thing over here? Yeah, that's how we knew. Uh, Marwin himself says to Sam, tell me all you told our Dornish Sphinx. I know much of it and more, but some small parts may have escaped my notice. So not only did Marwin know Sam was coming, but he was aware of much of the story he'd be telling. And as for his agenda, he does tell Sam that he should stay and forge his chain, adding, if I were you, I would do it quickly. A time will come when you'll be needed on the wall. So his agenda for Sam seems to be control him, control the the information that he's that he's brought to the Citadel for one reason or another, and just get Sam to kind of focus on um, studying to become a maester. Marwin, maybe he needs more allies in the Citadel. <laughs> hmm. It's also, I also find it a little funny that Alaris is like, by the way, like, we schemed about you. Like, does, does Alaris actually feel bad about things? That would be a uh, interesting twist for that character. But as you said, Marwin specifically sought out Sam while his print of him speaking to anyone outside of his circle, and definitely not the Seneschal, who I believe is Walgrave at the moment. Is that the Seneschal? Walgrave, and uh, but Walgrave is kind of Gaga, so I yeah, think it's, so it's Theobald. Theobald. Theobald, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he goes on to say that Sam should not breathe a word of it to anybody, making claims about murderers among the Citadel. Meanwhile, he literally runs out of the Citadel, leaving so fast he leaves behind dust clouds like uh, the Roadrunner as he runs <laughs> off to find Danny. It feels maybe. like Marwin is buying himself maybe a little bit of time here so that he can be the one to make it to Danny first and escape Old Town before anyone is a wiser. Because as we know, Old Town's a little bit under lockdown at the moment because of the uh, the krakens in the water around it. And keeping, scam, keeping Sam scared and isolated is a really good way to do that. If you tell somebody, if you say a word, you're going to die, well, they're probably not going to say anything. <laughs> and I think the key here is actually the glass candle that was mentioned and its limitations, which is not something we've that uh, George has talked about a lot, but I think it's really important. Marwin says here that small parts may have escaped his notice. And I think that might be a bit of an understatement because it's not like a video camera that records and then you can sort of fast forward to find like the juicy bits of anything. You have to sit down and it's like a one-to-one -one time device. It's like a FaceTime, less like um, a surveillance of the entire world. You can see far, but it has to be now and you have to choose what you're seeing. So Marwin obviously cannot be watching 24 seven. And even if he could, he cannot see everything at the wall or beyond. So if he's using it, and even if he's using it to invade dreams to like catch up on stuff, he can only see what dreams are the dreamers currently having. So he may have a very, very scattered understanding of Sam's journey and Eamon's journey, and he needs Sam to fill in the blanks and provide the narrative. It's kind of like uh, when you watch those YouTube clips, like uh, that one channel movie clips, they take an entire movie and they break it down into 10 three minute clips. And it's like, if you watch them, you kind of get an idea of what the movie's like, but you kind of want to see what's in between. And I think that's what Marwin's doing here with Sam. He wants Sam to tell him the parts in between to tie everything together into a cohesive series of events. And for some reason, he wants to know that before the rest of the Citadel. And I think part of me wonders if this is motivated maybe by urgency that he thinks the rest of the Citadel will not believe Sam and may not act until it's too late to stop whatever's going on beyond the wall and perhaps bring about the long night. Perhaps Marwin, like many characters, has a savior complex going on. It could be true, and I appreciate you sort of pointing out the limitations of the glass candle because it's it's not a one-for-one <clears throat> -one parallel with green seeing, which might be a misconception. You're not a time traveler or anything like that. It's a real-time, like you say, Skype call. Or FaceTime. 
<laughs> okay, I just want to sort of stay on the subject and develop this a bit further. So That's speaking great. of Marwin's agenda, as we've mentioned, as soon as he hears Eamon's words concerning Daenerys Targaryen and the dragons, the bringing in the prophecy, he appears to drop everything on the spot and leave for the docks right then in order to catch the Cinnamon Wind's return leg to Essos. So why exactly does he leave so abruptly and what does he hope to achieve? Joe. Ooh, I have a lot to say about this one. Uh, this is something that uh, myself and the uh, members of the Radio Westeros Discord were talking about earlier this week. Uh, you guys made the character of the week, Maester Marwan. It's Were you guys baiting me? Was this for me? <laughs> is that what was going on? I wish I was baiting you, Joe. <laughs> Just pure coincidence. Just pure coincidence. No reason at all, just to get me going. Yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, Marwin is a known glass candle user, which means that he can, in theory, see probably anywhere in the world that he wants to at any time. It's very likely that he does not need rumors, nor Samuel Tarly, to confirm to him that Daenerys Stormborn is alive, has dragons, and rules as Queen of Marine. He can just essentially open up the app and say, show me Marine," and then he'll see it. He can... And we know that this is happening because it seems very likely the other suspected user of the Palantiri, I mean Glass Candle, sorry, that was some <laughs> Tolkien running through there, uh, is Quaith. It's because she appears quite regularly to Danny in Visions and Dreams, most assume that she's doing that via Glass Candle. She even mentions that the Glass Candles are burning, so that's probably her. So it's not like there's a barrier around Danny or anything like that. Marwin could probably just check in whenever he feels like it. Um, so I think the dragons and the news about Danny from Sam are a bit of a faint by George here because they're disguising the really, really juicy information that Sam the Slayer just brought to him from the Night's Watch. And that is Sam's adventures beyond the wall, that he slayed an other, that there are others right now, that an obsidian dagger can kill them, that they are forming an army, they're marching on the wall, like they have a massive army, they're basically unstoppable at this point where they're attacking, and how many there are. I think maybe Marwin already knows this, but this might be the things that escaped his, his view, because we know that the wall blocks many other things. It blocks magic, like we, uh, the dragons of Alisane were like, oh, no, I don't want to go anywhere near that, and turned around and hissed at her, which they had never done before. Uh, we know that there's maybe a problem with warging through it, that the undead can't walk through it that's what cold hand says he says i can go no further so maybe the idea is is everything beyond the wall is blocked from glass candle user's sight and that might explain why marwin's sitting there very intently going like oh shit <laughs> so this is what's going on um i think that's probably a reasonable guess that the magical barrier extends to all kinds of magic including glass mm -hmm. candles and mm -hmm. this sets up a very big information gap for marwin in that he's aware that the Night's Watch brothers are really worried about something beyond the wall, but he can't. if he can't see it, then can he really know? He has Aemon's letter sent out to War in the Realms, but Aemon's old. Maybe he's gone a little senile. Maybe he's making things up. Um, or maybe this is a ploy by the Night's Watch and J.R. Mormont to get more funding for the wall, as they have been falling on hard times for quite a long time now. Maybe trying to trick the Iron Throne to helping them. Or they're pretending it's the others when it's just a king beyond the wall and they just need help. And it's not necessarily a supernatural meta threat on the world. So if it, and then you look at his surveillance of Sam all the way from Bravos to Old Town, this may indicate that he was like intently watching, going like, Sam, please talk about this. Sam, please talk about this. Please say this to anybody so that he can figure out what they're doing and confirm the story that, yes, the others are on the move. So he hears about that, and what does he do? He packs up, runs out of the Citadel, and runs to Daenerys because the last thing that Mar that Sam tells Marwyn is about Danny, but it's specifically that Aemon believes her to be the prince that was promised in Azor High. And you can't have a mythical hero without a mythical threat. And Sam just told him there's a mythical threat, and it's real, and it's happening today. <laughs> so what can Marwyn do? Agree with Marwyn and make a beeline for Daenerys. I think there's a lot of excellent exposition that Marwin can provide the reader as a master of the higher mysteries, acquirer of rare books, and as someone who has been to a shy, which is pretty exciting. But with Sam's story and proof, the most important thing he can offer to Danny is that she needs to change her goal from the Iron Throne to saving Westeros and beyond. 
I think I've heard that plot before. I mean, didn't that happen with another kind of Targaryen who everybody thought was the prince that was promised? Oh, yeah, Stannis. It's happening <laughs> again. So everyone will be telling her that she needs to go to King's Landing, take her birthright, knock over Cersei. Marwyn will be the one saying, screw the Iron Throne. You'll have no one to rule over if everyone is dead. The show gave this gave this job to Jon Snow when he traveled to Dragonstone. But I think George is going to have Marwyn play this role, at least initially. If he can really see her dreams too, maybe he'll bring up that particular dream she has about unleashing dragon fire on all these curious icy foes at the Trident. Hmm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, things might start to make sense for Daenerys. And <clears throat> although Marwyn speaks about the dangers of prophecy with the famous line, prophecy will bite, bite your prick off, I, I think he's really intrigued by anything mystical and so is extremely interested in what Maester Aemon had to say. I think as a Maester, Aemon had a great deal of knowledge and integrity and coupled with the birth of the dragons is enough to set Marwyn about travelling to Daenerys. Being an Archmaester, Marwyn no doubt has expertise in both conventional maester affairs and his interest in the supernatural is well documented. I believe on one level he wants to witness the dragons with his own eyes and evaluate Daenerys and her situation. Once he's seen these magical beasts with his own eyes and with Aemon's assertion that she could be a prophesied figure, Marwyn might want to guide her, advise her, and do all the things a standard maester offers, as well as educating her about Westeros prophecy, and perhaps even in tandem with Tyrion, how to control and use dr the dragons to their full potential if a long night situation should arise. We also have a theory that Marwyn might have been the unaccounted for maester on Dragonstone during Robert's Rebellion, who would have overseen Danny's birth. And in this case, Marwyn might provide Daenerys and the reader with significant information about her mother and family and some of her backstory blind spots that she seems to have. <clears throat> yeah. I, you know, I love the idea of Marwyn's role being this kind of exposition for Danny on a wide range of topics. Obviously, that idea that he could be the maester who delivered Danny and bring her all kinds of information about her family. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, what she wants out of life, really. Uh, she doesn't know anything about her own family. However, um, you know, really, there are so very few people in A Song of Ice and Fire who are without their own agendas. And, um, what his might be is pretty fascinating to consider. Um, but really in order to predict what his agenda is, we'd have to know how much he saw with his glass candle and what arcane knowledge he's in possession of exactly. How much does he really know about dragons, others, prophecies, Lightbringer, Azor High, etc.? How about Rhaegar, Lyanna, John, Danny, and Aegon? So it all could hinge on you know, what he, what knowledge he might have brought to uh, the glass candle. So having speculated that perhaps he can't see beyond the wall, maybe he knows, you know, little enough about Blood Raven, the children of the forest and the others. But, <clears throat> you know, if the candle doesn't work in the way, in a way that's similar to how Blood Raven explains the Weirwood network, works you know like you guys were saying earlier um then he's gonna have significant gaps in his knowledge about all these other things that are pretty important and um someone um you know while he's intent on possibly directing the narrative um you know in a good cause i would expect um he's he's gonna have you know to get some information from somewhere else so um i, I don't think He's going to be there solely to service Danny and her arc. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that's going to be a, a big part of it. But uh, he's still going to need to be collecting information from elsewhere as he goes. Maybe he has um, some way to communicate back to the Citadel after he's gone to his little research team. <laughs> <laughs> his gr his group of interns his interns <laughs> scattered isn't interns that a great segue into the next question 
Oh, you're muted, Duke. Bye. Oh, I know why. I'll um, I'm gonna mute myself. Okay. I'll see to this issue. I'll let Yoke Boy come back. Hey guys, we just got a, a puppy, a Radio Westeros puppy <laughs> called Tessie. She doesn't like being on her own, so we're gonna have to run off every like 15 minutes and give her some peanut butter to uh, cheer her up. But yeah, this uh, runs in nicely what we were saying to our next question. Marwin has lit this magical glass candle with its bright light filling up his chambers. And when he rushes off, he seems to leave the glass candle burning in his chamber. So what will come of that glass candle? How could Samwell or anyone else at the Citadel use this glass candle? What are the possibilities? What can happen, Joe? Well, one thing you can do is check in on Tessie and see how the puppy's doing and make sure she's getting her peanut butter and all that yeah. kind of things. <laughs> it's a very important job. You got to make sure you do it. The and most important. Your chat, your chat is is demanding the puppy. So I think at some point you're going to have to put her on camera. <laughs> Maybe all right. Today. If you stick around by the end of this stream, if you stick around till the end, I'll bring up the puppy and you can all meet Tessie. She's wonderful. She's, she's a cute. shepherd husky mix. But more on that later. Joe, take it away. What What's the possibilities with this glass candle? You know, it's so, there in the chambers. It's ready to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe Marwin has a pocket-sized glass candle made after the famed Valyrian artist, artist, oh, the famed Valyrian artificer, uh, Stevios Jobaris or something like that. Maybe he's got an iPhone, an eye glass candle or something like that. But, you know, it does seem really reckless for him to leave it behind when you could conceivably use it all the way to Slaver's Bay, and he probably has a, a major use for it because there's a whole bunch of armies and blockades in his way before he can get to Slaver's Bay. Like, one ship passing through all that is going to be pretty much impossible to the point that other characters are like, I'm not even going to bother trying to sail there. It's, it's a fool's errand. So perhaps he thought that maybe he could not get out of the Citadel in Old Town with, you know, like, a three foot tall sword like burning husk of obsidian without being noticed maybe that's like a step too far like Marwin, that's a, what are you doing with the glass candle don't worry about it guys i'll be back no no problem not contraband i'm not stealing this everything's fine maybe that's like one like practical possibility but you know maybe there's another like more fancy possibility like perhaps it only works near the fused black stone at the base of a high tower or you need some other kind of like relic from one of the fallen magical empires around for it to function. Like the other ones that we know that are lit are in Karth and Karth is an ancient magical city. So maybe there's <laughs> something like that going on. Uh, but it's tough to say because it really is such a huge oversight for a guy who spends half the chapter explaining how cool and valuable it is for him, even ridiculing Sam for not realizing it to leave it behind. Uh, this implies to me that as a on a meta level that george has some major limitations for their use that he has not set on the page yet <clears throat> yes um i want to i want to show this comment here because i think this is a great point <laughs> uh thank you tim marwin says what valerians could do with glass candles not what he can do with one. So so there's that. I mean, right off the bat. Uh, watch but, YouTube. They can yeah. watch YouTube. <laughs> right? Uh, what I really want is for Sam to be able to use that candle. But let's talk about uh, the possibility that glass candles can only be used by one person. That they are uh, they can be bound or are bound to a specific user. You know, like your iPhone with your face facial recognition. It's only going to work for you. Sorry. Uh, our Flaming Lightbringer patron, uh, TJ, raised this idea in a Discord discussion, the same one we were talking about earlier. Um, comparing it to the way Makoro says the Hellhorn is bound to its owner, Marwin tells Sam that all Valyrian sorcery was rooted in blood or fire. And of course, Makoro suggests to Victorian that blood can be used or is used to bind the horn to a new owner. Uh, as we've said a few times recently, it remains to be seen if this is accomplished by kind of smearing your blood on an object, like in the uh, Victorian Winds of Winter sample chapter, we actually see him, you know, wiping his blood on the hell horn. I'm not sure that's 
definitely the, the what's supposed to happen. Or maybe if a there's a more scene. violent prescription. Horror, horror. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, don't oh, like, it. don't like going, but, um, you know, I think it's more likely to be, you have to kill off the, uh, the former owner, like, you know, uh, for you Harry Potter fans out there, like, like the elder wand, you know, it only, uh, it's, it's owned by a person until that person is, killed or dies and you know whoever is responsible for that gets to take over ownership that's the blood factor possible you know not really sure and obviously that's the hell horn so getting back to glass candles uh you know we do think it's pretty obvious we've said this a lot of times in the past that there's blood magic involved in their use in lighting one and giving given marwin's statement to sam about valerian sorcery i think we can combine that with you know what we hear about glass candles you know um all the uh novices at the citadel try to light one and they you know sit there overnight trying to light it and then they uh wait for the dawn with their hands bloody bloody hands i think there there's a real hint there that there's some sort of blood magic is the key maybe they don't really know how to do it <laughs> so you know if this creates some sort of exclusivity for the user you know that might explain why marwin feels comfortable just leaving that thing burning while he just takes off for the far side of the world he's just like yeah i'll leave my magic tv on because nobody can see the screen unless i'm there with the descrambler so you know he's keeping the puppy happy it making it, like it's gonna keep talking like yeah. you leave the tv on to make sure a young yeah. puppy's very happy <laughs> right exactly Oh, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. So this talk about the glass candle, you, you know, leaving it burning is very exciting <laughs> to me, like the possibilities. Wow, no one really knows. So I hope that Sam does use the candle. And it, it does seem sort of wasteful of George. If he has Marwin light it, leave it behind, and then our POV can't use it or doesn't use it. Of course, there are several other characters who might want to use it, but it would be nice to see Sam look into its light and search for the wall, perhaps. George does like to limit the use of magic, and Sam's inexperience could be the perfect barrier in so much as he might be able to conjure a vision of the wall and see what's going on there, but perhaps he won't be able to enter people's dreams or anything complicated as a skilled candelier such as Marwin or really Quaith might be able to do. So I think just a touch of this sorcery in Sam's story would be adequate and very exciting for the readers. He might see the chaos and aftermath of John stabbing or something further along in the timeline as, as we turn the pages, which could add to the urgency of Sam's return up north. It, it could make him think, you know, I've got to leave now at some point and get back to John. Uh, you just made me think of something. I mean, I'm just going to throw this out there quickly. You know, those old over the air TV antennas that you had to mm -hmm. point it in a certain direction. I grew up with one of those. Yeah. Um, so if you're, maybe the glass candle has to be kind of trained by a certain person to a certain, you know, by someone who's trained to use it um, to a place or event or person, you know, that it's watching. Maybe, in other words, Sam can watch one thing and one thing only, whatever Marwin left the candle kind of like zeroed in on. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, so like all he's got is the QVC channel. All he's going to see. Exactly. It's the only, he's got one channel. He's got channel three and then someone's hanging off the, off the side of the thing like this. I don't know. He's just watching the docs because that's the last thing Marwin was watching. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. The last person to use it was Leo Tyrell. He was looking for naked ladies. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> well, there you go. There's your answer. Don't say that we don't find it's answers here. <laughs> That's a porn channel. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yes. Okay. No more fat pink mass, please. So uh, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sam has met several peers in Old Town so far, and his situation as a novice is comparable in some ways to his arrival at the wall as a new recruit in a Game of Thrones all the way back there. How will he get along at the Citadel? 
Will we see him encountering any of the same problems that he suffered at the wall? Will Sam react to any conflict with the same cowardice he initially displayed at Castle Black? Lady Gwynne. When Sam arrived at the wall, he was an admitted craven. He was a, you know, he was a bullied, abused boy. Um, and he continued to be mercilessly bullied by all the other recruits until Jon Snow stepped in to protect him. But now, although he still occasionally lapses into thinking of himself in those terms, he doesn't act like that anymore. He's simply not that person anymore. Everything that's happened to him has combined to make him so much more confident um, uh, with himself and of himself. We see him thinking through uh, the danger uh, that is present for Gilly and the baby and how best to protect them in a way that a Game of Thrones Sam never would have imagined. I mean, I, I don't see him being anything like the passive and frightened creature who arrived at Castle Black all those months ago. In fact, who even the person who left Castle Black at the beginning of A Feast for Crows, as we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, also, I don't see him having any real conflict with any of his fellows at the Citadel. Leo Tyrell might actually have been the worst of it. And even though that made him nervous based on their past knowledge of one another, Sam really faced him and came away relatively unscathed. Leo made his usual stupid comments but he does that to everybody you know sam didn't come out any the worse than any other novice does really so i think when sam faces conflict at this stage it's going to be of a much more serious nature maybe not others serious but possibly ironborn serious or as we'll be discussing later randall tarley serious and these are the sort of things that he's actually proved himself to be capable of thinking through and kind of problem solving. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think he's going to be having the same issues that he had all those months ago. You're muted. Sorry. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you make great points, Lady Gwyn, about the difference between then and now. And I want to dispel any notion that people might have that Sam's time at the Citadel, you know, is destined to be sort of slow and laborious and he's learning and he's, you know, going to classes and it's a little bit sort of mundane. I think when Sam first arrives, he has to wait and wait and the pacing is slowed right down and we're sort of lulled. However, this is a feint, as within pages, Sam is rushed off to Marwyn's chambers, and the whole sequence becomes quite exciting. Now, I don't think George will be making things easy for a POV in a new environment, but compared to the wall, you have to imagine that Sam is far better suited to the Citadel. Sam knows that this is a place that he can excel he thinks how he should have run here earlier in his life during his final feast chapter, that he's well suited for it. Plus, as Lady Gwyn is highlighting, Sam is changing. He's not quite the finished product just yet, but we might wonder if his time at the Citadel will be his finishing school, so to speak. There are characters who aren't going to be kind to him. And he's definitely going to encounter some danger. But I think we'll see Sam overcoming these obstacles himself this time, in contrast with his early time at the Wall, when he really depended on Jon Snow and other friends to defend him, find him a place within the institution and encourage him. I think this is going to be a, a different story. Now we're going to see a more proactive Samwell using his wits and a degree of newfound courage to control his own story rather than be the reactive craven we first witnessed in the training yard at Castle Black. Yeah, uh, you guys make some great points. I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here. So everyone buckle up. Uh, <laughs> one thing that is undercutting a lot of Sam's chapters and something that you have to acknowledge when you're analyzing him is that Samuel Tarly is of all characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, the most who resembles George R. R. Martin. He has described him as the truest self-insert. 
in a Comic-Con Q&A, he said this question, who do you see yourself as in the books? What character has the most of you in him? George said, I'd like to say Tyrion, but it's really Samuel Tarly. Tyrion gets more action. He gets laid more, quote unquote, laughter, apparently from the tra- from the transcript. But I'm really more like Sam. And there's many other instances of him basically saying the same thing. He wishes he was Tyrion or John, but in his heart, he knows that he's Sam. The awkward, bookish, overweight, bullied, kind of a loner, and someone that lived in fiction in the, in the written word. That's George's life as well as Sam's. And that's not really that unusual for Martin as a writer. Many of his early protagonists are deliberate self-inserts. He talks about it all the time, especially in uh, in dream songs like Rob in A Song for Leah, Traeger in Meat House Man, Dirk Talarin in Dying of the Light, The Great and Powerful Turtle in Wild Cards. These are all George. The list goes on and on. Why this matters is that George very often writes his self-inserts starting off as a fish out of water until they find someone or a group of people that makes them come alive and makes them feel safe, which mirrors his own experiences finding the sci-fi and fantasy writing convention circuits, as well as chess. He's really obsessed with chess. He loves chess. But in these environments, he really blossomed and completely changed his life by learning by leaning into his skills among like-minded people instead of trying to fit in somewhere else he never felt welcome. Hey, that sounds like Sam at, at Horn Hill and also Castle Black. Now, I think we can use this basic formula of his autobiography in a way to tell us what's probably going to happen with Sam. He was a fish out of water at the Night's Watch and never fit in in the slightest. So at the Citadel, we have a natural repetition of this plot for Sam to finally feel like he's among his peers, to use his mind and be valuable in a way that most Night's Watch brothers resented him for. And as you have both said, Sam is growing up, becoming more confident, and willing to stand up for himself by leaps and bounds. The Sam we see at the Citadel very well might be a significant change in personality who's not going to be taking crap off people like Leo Tyrell anymore. The show may have given us a glimpse when he showed up to the Archmaesters. I have a feeling George's version might be even more dramatic. When his self-inserts generally reach their potential in this way, they tend to soar in terms of what they do in the story and in their own lives. Although he didn't quite get all the um, all of his fears and stuff knocked off. Randall the Vandal, as he's known, the primary antagonist of Sam's life, is still out there for him to conquer. And the other thing that Sam, if Sam continues down this rough autobiography of George, is there's a heartbreak coming. That's generally the... Um, the the path of his characters their self inserts roughly where salmon is in his life is where george went through um a heartbreaking divorce and then being broken up with by his girlfriend for his best friend both of which dominated his fiction for decades to come and continue to this day so that's something that as you think through the way he writes his self inserts Tyrion went through this already it's still coming up for sam and that's something that um i'm not particularly looking forward to in t wow because that would involve gilly i guess but that's troubling. <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> I'm sad now. I know. All of, all of his early stories are about heartbreak and characters mm-hmm. trying to get over it and finding themselves. And it's like, oh, yeah, he's he's writing his life. And Sam is his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're, we're talking about Samwell's growth. Everyone's, <laughs> all three of us have, have mentioned this, that, he you know, he's changed over time since A Game of Thrones. So why don't we go there? Throughout to Feast for Crows, Sam's journey south from the wall to Old Town via Bravos. This was a chance for George to give Samwell some space from the Night's Watch and allow his character to grow and sort of find himself. So what changes took place in Sam's character on the journey south, Lady Gwyn? Well, yeah, he's changed. We've said he's changed a lot since the Game of Thrones, but I said a few minutes ago, he's changed a lot in A Feast for Crows. So I started collecting some specifics just from Feast, and uh, it's really amazing. Uh, the you know the the one for one things if you going from Sam one to Sam five. So let's go over a few of them, and then we can you know have a discussion about what what these changes were. Regarding women in Sam one uh, about his talking or thinking about a uh, Val, the princess was so pretty that he off found himself stammering and blushing in her presence. And then he thinks about Gilly 
Gilly's presence always flustered him and gave rise to, well, risings. Oh, oh here we are. We're just diving that right big into mess. this. It's here. Pink mess. That pink mess. Right there. It's foreshadowed right there in Sam 1. But so obviously, obviously there's that. That's from Sam 4. But um, in Sam 5, he thinks, if I stay with Gilly very much longer, how will I ever find the strength to leave her? He's in and, and any, you know, they kiss goodbye when he goes into Old Town. He's full circle. He's not only not necessarily as flustered in her presence anymore. And, and, you know, but he's actually, you know, viewing her as a partner, at least a potential partner. Let's look at archery. He hated longbow practice almost as much as he hated climbing steps. When he wore his gloves, he could never hit anything. But when he took them off, he got blisters on his fingers. Those bows were dangerous. And he also says, I'm still the worst archer who ever bent a bow. That was in spite of hours of practice that Jon Snow was forcing upon him. Then in uh, Sam 5, he's aboard the Cinnamon Wind and they're being uh, shadowed by some ironborn ships. And Kojimo, it says, waited till the long ship came within 200 yards before she gave the command to loose. Sam loosed with them. And this time he thought his arrow reached the ship. Sam! Sam with a golden heart bow, 200 yards, and he reached the target. That's astounding. Uh, his fears at the beginning, he thinks he's told he's got to go, and he's he's really, really scarred about ocean voyages that he took as you know with his family as a child. And he's thinking, all that water, I could drown, ships sink all the time, autumn is the stormy season. And, you know, he, the bright side is that Gilly would be with him and he's kind of trying to help Gilly. And he says, uh, uh, yeah, my mother and sisters will help Gilly too. And then he thinks, oh, I can send a letter. I don't need to go to Horn Hill myself because he's afraid of Horn Hill. He's afraid of his family. Apparently even, you know, his mother uh, on some level. He's also afraid of blood, of heights, of seasickness, of drowning. You oh, said that one. Of mice. He's terrified of everything. Then um, <clears throat> he all. Then he says, "Once we reach Old Town, I'll hire a wagon and some horses and take her there myself. That way, he would make certain the castle and its garrison. And if any part of what he saw or heard gave him pause, he would just turn around and bring Gilly back to Old Town." So that's in Sam Five. Huge difference. He's confident. He has, for some reason, he's certain of his ability to protect Gilly and um, assess <laughs> the the uh, defenses of Horn Hill. So he's afraid of heights. Uh, it's, a, you know, he's thinking about the winch cage. As much as he hated steps, he hated the winch cage more. He always closed his eyes when he was riding it, convinced that the chain was about to break. Yet to be seen, I included this one because Sam is now in Old Town and we have the possibility of him going to the high tower, which is higher than the wall. So I think we could see the flip side of him being terrified of heights uh, yet to come. Uh, then of course, there's physical changes. You get lots of food jokes uh, in Sam one. Everybody's talking about, uh, you know, how much he loves his food and he's winded after going climbing four stairs. Uh, but then in Sam five, he says to coach Mo, I'm not so fat as I was before. The passage south had seen to that all those watches, nothing to eat but fruit and fish. And it also says he felt a shabby thing beside them in his baggy blacks. So his clothes are baggy. He knows that his body's changed, in spite of the fact that people still see him as a very big guy. And I said somewhere else recently, let's face it, his father, Randall, is a very tall, big man. Other than being fat, Sam's stature, his height is never really mentioned. So, I mean, he could just be a guy that's always going to be kind of barrel chested and, and tall. He's definitely changed. There's no doubt about that. Finally, Slayer. He's very upset about being called Slayer back at the wall. Pip and Gren are teasing him about it. And he says, don't call me Slayer. What does he do when he gets to Old Town? He sees <laughs> Leo Tyrell and he tells him, I went beyond the wall and fought in battles. They call me Sam the Slayer. <laughs> what a badass. He did it. I know. <laughs> uh, he's just a different person from Sam 1 to Sam 5. So, discuss. 
Well, you make so many great comparative points there, Lady Gwyn. So much change that you've highlighted. Samuel Tali is approaching a crossroads of character development. There's all the signs that he is growing as a character. And since he left for the wall, he's really been on a manhood coming of age type arc. George really needed to get him away from his friends for this change to occur. And soon, soon enough, he's having sex with Gilly, firing off arrows against the Ironborn from Cinnamon Wind, all signifying he's gaining the independence and confidence needed to grow from boy to man. He's changing mentally and emotionally. He's changing physically. And don't get me wrong, he's never going to be a totally different character. He will always be this Samwell we know and love. But the long voyage has allowed him to reevaluate who he is and what he wants. One thing that's missing from your list, Lady Gwen, is is he still afraid of mice? Has he gotten over that one? Yeah, I don't know. Let's, read let's... read the winds of winter to find read out. Read the winds of winter. I'm sure there's going to be a mouse in that little in that little uh, cell that they've given. There's him definitely now. a mouse in Marwin's chambers because it's got to be a mouse it, in it the room. It was very unkempt. <laughs> And in the, all those books, and there's no way they're, there's going to be mice everywhere. Maybe this will be the thing that causes Sam to have a total emotional breakdown. <laughs> Not mice. <laughs> no. Uh, but I think it says, uh, building on what you guys said, it says a lot about what George plans for his uh, doppelganger that he has cataloged literally every character flaw he's introduced in previous chapters and fears that he has. And then Within a series of chapters, Sam has gotten over them, confronted them, succeeded at things he used to fail at. This shows not only a tremendous personal growth, but also, like on a meta level, how high George is aiming for Sam's role in the coming books. He's not actively crashing and burning like somebody like Victorian Greyjoy, Ari's Oakheart, or Aaron Gray Greyjoy, to name a few of his POVs that you can kind of tell are on their way out. I mean, Aris, he's already dead, but. You could kind of see that coming even before Hota took his head off. This kind of dramatic change in him and dramatic upwards change is much closer to something you see from characters like Bran and Arya. Those two often get talked about for big reasons for the five-year gap by George, which he didn't end up doing, but that he wanted to give them in particular five years to grow up and come into their own as people. Well, Samuel's kind of in a similar place as both of them at the end of A Storm of Swords because He's a fairly immature man, even though he's uh, far older than either of them. And then Je and then George gets him on the sim and wind, and he throws him through a ninja warrior style challenge of his character in one voyage and comes out the other side a brand new man. I would take this glow up that he got during his voyage as an indication that Sam has a lot more challenges coming his way that George felt that he needed to more or less level up to be ready for. Like, for instance, for instance, the potential sack of Old Town confronting Randall, maybe having a major role in the War for the Dawn or the politics of what happens after we assume the others are defeated. Sam the Slayer um, could end up, because it's, it's positioned as his mocking name, but this is the kind of thing that in George's stories, when characters become like heroes of the ages, like that's the kind of name that would stick. Give it like a few hundred years and Samwell might go from this cowardly boy at the night's watch and become a great hero of house tarley sam the slayer nobody would know the difference anyway yeah i mean he is the first person to kill another for what eight thousand years or something okay guys we are around halfway through the live stream and i'm pleased to tell you all that today we're opening the doors to our private discord forum for the next few hours we do analysis threads we have fun we play games we hang out talk about food pets and all of that stuff is a good place to come and hang out with us uh, you can find the link to this discord in the youtube description below and yeah we hope to see some of you there as many of you that wants to come and join us we'll leave it open for a few hours so guys come and join our discord cheers Okay, so why don't we begin with the second half today? Now Sam has undergone some change. It will be interesting to see him in a new place with new challenges to see how he holds up. His fellow novices and acolytes 
are an interesting and varied bunch, to say the least. So let's talk about Pate, Alaraz, and Leo Tyrell. First of all, we'll begin with Pate. He is a character we see die in the prologue, yet there he is in Marwyn's chambers. Who is Pate and what is he after? And I think I'll take this, begin this one. Prior to Sam's arrival at the Citadel, we last saw Pate die in the Feast prologue, so it's very curious to see him alive and well at the tail end of the book. Keen-eyed readers have noticed that the alchemist look an, looked an awful lot like Jack and Hagar's new glamour, with this distinctive hook nose, scar, and tightly curled black hair. Then Pate introduces himself as Pate like the pig boy to Sam at the end there. In what are the closing words of A Feast for Crows? But we know that the real Pate would have never likened himself to the pig boy as it was a term that he disliked and people used it against him. I think this is an open and shut case. There's no doubt in my mind that Jacken is now masquerading as Pate, using the face-changing magic of the faceless men to pull this off. What we can't be sure of is why exactly the faceless men are infiltrating the Citadel. As we'll see shortly, there does seem to be a convergence of spies in the Citadel right now. Fans speculate if Jacken wants to get his hands on the old tome, The Death of Dragons, and perhaps Lady Gwen and Joe can elaborate as to why that might be after I speak. But I just wanted to point something out that might not have been part of Jacken's plans. Jacken has just witnessed perhaps the most critical conversation in the history of Westeros. A member of the Night's Watch giving, a, giving an account of the others, whites, dragons, prophetic wisdom, and so on, all in one story. Perhaps Jacken just wanted to get his hands on a book, but remembering how the faceless men are trained to be the perfect spies, we must now consider that they are privy to much information and more about the upcoming era of wonder and terror. What the faceless men will think of all of this, especially the re-emergence of the others, is a really difficult question, but an intriguing one. So what do you think, Lady Gwyn, about this Pate Volume 2? She's having some problems hearing us. So... Yeah, she can't hear us talking. Can you hear us? She can't. Okay. Go, Joe. Okay, why don't you take us, take us away with your answer, Joe, while we try and figure uh, this out. She's got about 10 minutes then, if I'm going to say all this, so here we go. <laughs> um, so uh, all the speculation asks really one question about Jack and Hagar, and that is, like, does he have a method of communication back to the House of Black and White? Because this, if this is like one mission for him, it is the most convoluted mission I've ever heard of and requires a truly incredible amount of foresight by whoever hired him. Go to King's Landing, get caught, I guess, then go kill Balon one day before Euron arrives, then escape the Iron Man and go down to the Citadel and infiltrate it for reasons. The leading candidate is, of course, Euron for who hired Jack and at least for the Balon and Citadel jobs as Balon's death timing and the ghost of High Heart's dreams point to him pretty directly. And as his plan as king is to raid the Reach so far, so at least this is in the general area of the Citadel, and how that helps him is kind of unknown so far. If he can communicate somehow back to Bravos, then changing missions makes sense as he gets a new instructions. Or maybe he took on three separate jobs in Westeros at once and is just checking them off the list as he goes. But finding a through line for all he's done is something that the fandom struggled with and seemingly has failed at for years, unfortunately. Perhaps one of the weak points of George's gardening plotting style is uh, showing through. It doesn't happen, but it feels like Jackin's missions is one of those moments. So with the death of dragons, or I guess any kind of, kind of rare book in the citadel being a target by the way this is kind of funny they're running around behind me while i'm just talking this is scripted by the way that's how you guys know um <laughs> uh, this is a fan theory that has to do with now i'm just watching fascinated 
Oh, they're they're gonna listen on the same one. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I lost my uh I lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> this just became a solo stream. <laughs> like I just did. Oh, you guys are muted. We good? Sorry. Hey, sorry, sorry guys. Tech problem. Lady Gwen's had to come into my studio. Move, move this way. My uh, mic just stopped working. So. You guys, you broke the immersion. Now everyone knows you live together. Oh, <laughs> 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 I literally just came across the hallway. We're a secret couple. Uh, yeah. So. Oh my God, it's ruined. All the people uh, that had the hots for Yoke Boy now they're off the table. It all. Um. So let me, right. let me pick I, I, up with where where I was to... going to say some things. Um, I was about I was about halfway through what I was saying. You oh, you, oh, you go ahead, keep carry going. on. You okay, keep going. Right. I thought you were done and struggling. No, I actually got distracted by you guys and just started watching. It's <laughs> like oh, I don't know what's going on here. Um, so let's see here. Where was I? Oh, so the theory goes that he instead paid the faceless men with a dragon egg. Oh wait, no, no, I'm sorry. Where was I? Um. The Death of Dragons or other rare books in the Citadel being his target is a fan theory that has to do with Euron's supposed possession of a dragon egg that he threw into the sea in a black rage. The fan theory goes that instead of throwing it into the sea, he paid it to the Faceless Men as the prize for Balon Greyjoy's death. Knowing that they demand high prices for difficult kills, and now that they have it, the Faceless Men want to hatch that egg. And to do so, the theory goes that they suspect that these books contain the secrets. So Jockin will steal the book, deliver it back to the Faceless Men, who will, I then guess, hatch dragons? Um, or deliver the book to Euron? Well, that one makes a little bit more sense, because he has a shocking amount of interest these days and seeming like he's a Valyrian sorcerer himself. He's basically cosplaying one. So I'm not particularly sure about either of those. Because Danny's dragons took quite a long time to be fully grown. If the faceless men are the aware of some sort of need for dragons in like a meta sense, like with the others are fighting Danny, they know they don't have time to raise one. The most uh, exp the most potentially explosive information it would contain, though, would maybe be how to steal a dragon or use dragon binder and Valyrian sorcery on them. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to see what that book could contain that would be totally worth hiring Jack and Hagar to go get. Although one thing I would not rule out is that Jack and Hagar may change his mission now. As Yoke Boy said, he just overheard a lot of really alarming things about Sam, the others, the Long Night, Prophecy, Danny, and Dragons. He was in the room as Sam said all these things. So if anyone can use a glass candle, and it seems like maybe they can because Sam accidentally almost used it while staring into the flame then Jack and maybe be able to contact home base and let them know that, hey, uh, something came up. You might want to take a look at this whole like long night thing, something about Dragon Queen, she has dragons, and I don't know, the coming apocalypse. Much like how Marwyn heard this information and then went running out of the Citadel to get to Slaver's Bay, we may you may get ready to see Jack and kick his actions into high gear in Samwell's chapters and probably involve Sam with it somehow. Yeah. Yeah, very exciting stuff. Um, can't wait to see Pate in the Winds of Winter and see, you know, what what happens with him and what Sam thinks of him if he Pate. has any suspicions. Yeah, Pate. So, why don't we move on to another intriguing character that has got a, a secret to Alaraz? This curious character, Alaraz, spelt backwards, as noted by. The vast majority of the fandom is Sorella, one of the sand snakes that Doran Martel noted as playing some sort of political game. So what does uh, Alera's stroke Sorella want and what will become of her in the Winds of Winter? <laughs> Lady Gwyn. Well, I'm going to uh, minor correct. <laughs> He said it, she's playing a game. A lot of us assume that was a political game. But uh, Doran says Sorella is playing her game. So I actually tend to think that Oberyn's daughter uh, might merely be following in her father's footsteps because we know that Oberyn forged six links of a maester's chain at the Citadel uh, before he grew bored and just left, right? Uh, Alaris has forged three of her own so far. And I tend to think uh, that, uh, you know, that her 
her father, knowing that girls could be just as good as boys, uh, maybe dared her to do him one better and forge seven links. That can't you just see him dying laughing over his daughter, deceiving the gray sheep about, you know, who she is and, you know, getting this one over on them. As for what will become of her, you know, I, I think she's going to continue to be Sam's guide to the Citadel. And I, you know, I expect the group that's placed together at the end of Sam five, that is Sam, Alaris, Pate, and Leo uh, are going to function as a team on some level. Uh, could Alaris fall into danger as the parallel of Danny Flint, uh, a young woman who secretly joined a male order seems to suggest, you know, it is a song of ice and fire after all, but I'm not entirely convinced of this because Alaris has allies and, you know, there's no evidence that uh, Danny Flint did. Furthermore, Danny came to harm at the hands of the brothers that, uh, you know, she, that she was a part of. So I, I don't, I think the parallel kind of fails there. Obviously though, we've got the Ironborn approaching uh, Old Town and uh, all of these four, this whole group is going to be in danger of one form or another. So we, we can't really predict uh, what might happen to all of these people, all these kids really. So um, yeah, danger, danger. <laughs> Stranger danger. Stranger um, danger, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to agree here. I think Alaris or Sorella is carving out her own path from her father's by choosing her his learning side each of the sand snakes appear to have decided that they will take one part of oberon's personality as their favorite and that's going to be their whole thing they're going to try and mimic it obara obviously took up with the skill with weapons and the spear and his martial nature tyene took his poison fangs and his love of honestly poisoning people to death nymeria took his elegance and his dangerous sexuality well it appears sorella chose his mind duran doesn't really seem to have a firm grasp on what she's doing he calls it a game after hesitating which kind of implies to me that he's struggling to think of what the word is for what he should call what she's up to i think there's an expectation that sorella is up to something giving her latching onto marwin as her teacher and oberon as her father maybe she's sort of there as a spy for how old town will react to the coming targaryen invasions but duran's hesitancy doesn't really make me think that's what's going on and there's a couple quotes actually from Ariane about Sorella that I find illuminating. The first one is, uh, my uncle brought me here with Tyene and Sorella. The memory made Ariane smile. He caught some vipers and showed Tyene the safest way to milk them for their venom. Sorella turned over rocks, brushed sand off the mosaics, and wanted to know everything there was to know about the people who lived here. And then a quote uh, again from Ariane, Sorella is forever pushing in where she didn't belong. So this is telling us about a character who just wants to know everything. And there's no better place for a person like that than Old Town in the Citadel. If I had to guess, she's probably a lot more like Duran than Oberyn in that respect. She shows patience and restraint that her siblings and her father lack. I suspect that Sorella is merely in Old Town to do those things, to learn, to become a scholar. But through exposure to Marwin and now Sam, it appears that she's starting to find a cause for her life. There's a quote after listening to Sam that should indicate that the Sphinx thinks that helping Daenerys is what they should do. Alaris stepped up next to Sam. Aemon would have gone to her if he had the strength. He wanted us to send a maester to her to counsel her and protect her and fetch her safely home. That sounds like somebody that has been radicalized by what Sam just said. And it kind of also makes you wonder... In a general sense, does she know about Quentin's ill-fated wooing of the Dragon Queen? Maybe she's aware that's where he is. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe we should go see Daenerys. Maybe that's where Quentin's waiting with an army. Yeah, great points. And we're not done with the intriguing characters just yet. We've got Pate and we've got Alares, but we've also got the, the sort of bully, Leo Tyrell. He's rude, cocky, unpleasant to his fellows. But does Leo have an agenda? And what more can be said about his character that can be gleaned from our two Citadel chapters? And, of course, going forward into the Winds of Winter, I'll take this one. I, I think there's plenty of evidence in the two Citadel chapters that Leo is spying on behalf of House Tyrell. If we look at the prologue, we get this quote. The grey sheep have closed their eyes, but the mastiff sees the truth. 
Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. He stretched, smiling his lazy smile. That's worth a round, I'd say. So this passage is really quite profound for a young man who, at every other opportunity, displays what a sort of vulgar bully he can be. It's really, really out of place for him. I think the insinuation is that Leo has heard Marwin say these words and is merely repeating what he's heard through some closed door somewhere in the Citadel. So, Lady Gwynne, do you agree? And, of course, please elaborate. Yes, of course, I do agree. Uh, I think that Leo is a spy of some sort uh, in his own podcast. George R. R. Martin characterized Leo Tyrell as an important character, which would seem to imply some future importance, since so far his appearance in two chapters has been really mainly drive-bys. Uh, it's pretty clear from the Pate prologue that Leo's been listening at doors and in Sam 5, it really looks like he's continuing the trend. The main question, in my opinion, is whether he's spying for the Citadel or someone at the Citadel or House Tyrell, uh, you know, outside of the Citadel. He's well connected enough, really, that it could go either way. His father is Morin Martell, commander of the City Watch of Old Town. Uh, Morin is the younger brother of the late Lord Luther Tyrell, which makes Leo even though he's quite a bit younger, uh, he, he's Mace's first cousin. Uh, there's not much evidence that the Tyrells as a family, though, I mean, outside of, you know, power brokering, I don't think they really care what's going on in Marwyn's chambers. But in terms of the Citadel itself, Leo isn't the only Tyrell there. You've got Loads of them, actually. Leo's nephew, Medwick, is already accounted a full maester. And we've got another Tyrell cousin of some sort, Norman, who's the maester at Black Crown, which is the seat of House Bulwer, whose lady is yet another Tyrell. And then haha, there's Maester Gorman, who's Leo's uncle. And we hear in A Storm of Swords uh, that he came very close to being named Grand Maester. It says... The conclave accepted the fact of Picel's dismissal and set about choosing his successor after giving due consideration to Maester Turquin, the Cordwainer's son, and Maester Eric, the Hedge Knight's bastard, and thereby demonstrating to their own satisfaction that ability counts for more than birth in their order. The conclave was on the verge of sending us Maester Gorman, a Tyrell of Highgarden. I love the snark in the heck. In that quote, by the way, uh, that is uh, Varys speaking to Tyrion. Uh, Tywin put an end to all of this by reinstating his own man, Pycelle, but with Tywin, Kevin, and Pycelle all dead, and Varys fled, and the Tyrells seemingly in charge of things in King's Landing, at least for the moment, what's to stop the Conclave from sending Gorman to the Red Keep now? Uh, as someone who's poised to become the most powerful maester in the land, keeping an eye on the strange behaviors of Marwyn would seem like a natural thing for Gorman to want to do. But since Marwyn is no fool, we shouldn't rule out the possibility that he's manipulating Leo the Spy and feeding whoever it is he answers to exactly what he wants them to know. Yeah, I, I love uh, Varys's description. He's like, he's not just naming off the names. He's like, what are their virtues? Obviously, they wouldn't have sent him like, oh, we're sending you this person so that it shows that the, the that you love the small folk and anyone could rise high. He just like read into that. He knows these guys off the top of his head. He clearly already knows. Um, what are the names here? Uh, Turquin and Eric and Gorman. He doesn't even need to know their last names. He knows who they are already. Great Varys moment. Um, but adding on to that, I think it's interesting to think of Leo and the rest of these characters around Marwyn on kind of a meta level or maybe a predictive level. Level. Um, Leo represents the Tyrells in the Reach, obviously, Sorella the Dornish, Jockin kind of Bravos, I guess. As of yet, most of Westeros does not believe in the return of the others and are still fighting over the Iron Throne like nothing happening at the Wall really matters to them. And they only barely care about Danny, following the logic that Tywin said that She'll never come west. You know, Dothraki, don't go over water. She has dragons, but she's not She's not going to make it out of Slaver's Bay. Who cares? 
Sam's knowledge and Marwin's reaction has the potential for creating a serious ripple through the larger powers at play. Sorella seems pretty gung-ho about going to Team Danny. Leo is not privy to Sam's story, but he's going to notice Marwin is gone and this new Night's Watch brother is now there. He also may have been listening at the door, as Leo is wont to do. Marwin seemingly wanted Sam... Seem, Mar, uh, Marwin seemingly wanted everything Sam said to stay between him, Sorella, and Pate. Pate for some reason. I still don't understand that part. Does he know who Jacken is? Maybe he does. Um, but Leo represents kind of a patient zero for this kind of information getting out beyond what Marwin intends. If he gossips what he's heard about the others among the Citadel, among the Tyrells, there could be some serious repercussions to his actions. For instance, that Marwin will be guiding Daenerys and his family, um, will be guiding Daenerys and his family ties, could provide an unlikely alliance opportunity with them if Marwin ever makes it back with Daenerys. The show had Olena Tyrell take up with Danny as revenge after her family got wiped out, and that was okay, I guess, but Leo offers another narrative way to establish that diplomatic back channel. And if he hasn't discovered who Alaris is already, finding out she's a sand snake and her support of Danny could be very instructive for trying for the Reachmen to predict Doran's moves in the coming wars. There's big potential for Doran and the Reach to get information on each other through these two seemingly unimportant novices. Great points, Joe. Some two-way <laughs> spying going on. I think that could be what we're seeing here and samuel has finally made it to the citadel and has the chance to excel as a westerosi intellectual and ev eventually become an integral figure in the battle against the others he's such an important character now so our patron screenwriter catherine van pelt asks what will sam learn at the citadel how many if any links will he forge and when will he go back to the wall? So my own thoughts, how many links Sam earns could ultimately be irrelevant. There's much more at stake here than Sam's sort of vanity and his education. Really, the whole world's at stake. Sam needs to learn what's best for the Night's Watch in you know practical story terms and for the battle against the others. As such, I think Sam will be focused on that rather than racing against time to qualify as a standard maester, per se. Having said that, I would really love for Sam to earn a Valyrian steel link for the study of higher mysteries. That seems like a very cool link. And, you know, he is going to be reading about the others, surely. So, you know, that, that could happen. What do you think, Lady Gwen? Well, you know, as he rushes away, we said this earlier, Marwin tells Sam... You should stay and forge your chain. If I were you, I would do it quickly. A time will come when you'll be needed on the wall. I think Sam is going to be highly cognizant of that. Whether that involves expressly forging a chain or simply learning useful things, things that he needs to know back at the wall, which may not coincide with what the Maesters of the Citadel thinks he needs to know to forge a chain. I think that all remains to be seen. So does... So does how much Euron and the Ironborn out in the Red Wine Straits are going to affect his plans, obviously. I mean, that's that's just a huge kind of, you know, literal floating hammer waiting to come down on his head. So, but remembering he loved spending his time in the cellars below the wall uh, in what served as a library there. And also that one of his new companions is someone that we suspect might want to gain access to the vaults below the Citadel. And uh, so I could see Sam stumbling on some sort of treasure trove of information that could be highly useful at the wall. So maybe not directly related to his uh, official studies, but you know, some, something that he finds out by accident. You know, there's certainly, um, whether it's information of the sort that we saw him finding on the show is debatable, uh, but there's certainly a chance that he sees something along those lines. And if he finds out something about the others, even better. And when he hears about Aegon and maybe even Danny arriving in Westeros and things heating up or cooling down, I guess I should say, at the wall. Uh, Sam's going to be highly motivated to bring John this 
critical information that he's discovered with or without a chain. So either way, I think Marwin is correct. Very soon, Sam is going to be needed at the wall and his studies, uh, however he undertakes them in Old Town, are going to be very critical uh, to the outcome of things in the far north. I might understand, Lady Gwyn, that you were not a fan of Ragger and how many steps were in the Citadel and the yeah. mainly the morning bowel movements of the Archmaster for a vector of discovery <laughs> in the story. Maybe not. I actually started, I was going to say <laughs> that, you know, I, I was going to add uh, that I don't see uh, Gilly becoming Sam's research assistant and suddenly learning how to read and, you know, and, and her <laughs> baby. opening the one book that happens to contain a world shattering exactly. secret. <laughs> oh my god yeah no not, not a big fan of that but it, it could be a shortcut of you know showing that he easily picks up some pretty interesting information i have no doubt about that i suspect there are quite a lot of shortcuts taken in the last couple of seasons in order to make some plot lines fit together <laughs> Yeah, to say no, the least don't think so um, but you know unless george has a time skip in mind <laughs> um he almost certainly does not have any time for Sam to learn to forge a, a full chain, never mind maybe any links. Um, and as Lady Gwyn said, the biggest payoff for Sam in the Citadel is some kind of hidden or forgotten knowledge. I can completely imagine Jack and Agar manipulating Sam, Alaris, Armin, Rune, or Molander into showing him which books and places in Citadel are the most interesting or have the most arcane knowledge. Because not only is Sam new to the Citadel, but Jack and his too. He may even stick tightly to Sam through his chapters to try and absorb knowledge and possible places to try his newly acquired skeleton key. If Jack and is truly a master, uh, if Jack and is truly a master of the plot that is in manipulating these large scale events, then what he does and says around Sam may be highly instructive for his in his purposes. It's kind of like the same as when you read the Mystery Night and Maynard Plum shows up and then you later realize it's Blood Raven. You learn a lot about Blood Raven by reading Maynard Plum, just kind of talking offhandedly. Same thing here. Jacken's probably going to reveal a lot about himself and perhaps more exposition for the Faceless Men, which they sorely need. Uh, it's hard to say, though, what Sam could uncover that would be really, really juicy at this point. Uh, my personal pick beyond Death of Dragons, would possibly be Signs and Importance, the Book of Prophecies by Danis the Dreamer. If Marwyn has found three pages already, maybe there's more hidden in the Citadel somewhere. That could be very spicy for him to uncover, especially if he realizes its potential. There could, There's a lot he could also uncover that'd be really cool for us, detail-obsessed book nerds, to learn about. But plot-wise is kind of the real question here. Information on Rhaegar has the highest current explosive potential, as we were talking about, which they used him for in the show. But perhaps there's something about young Griff, something about the sack of King's Landing that could come to light. That would be interesting. But the one that really uh, has me going is Unnatural History by Septon Barth. That would be an incredible find. We know it not only has information about dragons, but the children of the forest. Seeing as Barth wrote part of it from information at Castle Black, he probably read every book just like Eamon did, and now Sam's away from those books. I would not be surprised at all if in Unnatural History, there's surprising truths about the others that are presented as legend or myth, but since we know it's Barth, it's probably correct. And as for uh, a forbidden book, Unnatural History was... Uh, supposed to be burned by order of King Baylor. So if it's there, it's going to be locked away behind perhaps a special skeleton key that Jack and Hagar just bought for a golden coin. All I know is for George, this is really going to be his last big shot for large scale exposition into something he needs the reader to know about others, dragons, anything that will be useful to Jon Snow in the coming war, because Brand's another vector for that, but it doesn't seem like he's really that close to interacting, whereas whereas Sam really is. And he's been hinting that Sam's going to make his way back. So anything he wants John to know going forwards, he's got to give it to Sam now to, to communicate. And one character we need to talk more of today is Gilly. Sam has brought Gilly along to Old Town where there are many dangers awaiting, you know, noted in Sam's thoughts as we 
enter into Old Town with Mance Raider's baby. The trio make a, a family that Sam wants to protect. So what will Sam do with Gilly and the baby to keep them safe? Lady Gwyn? I already I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you know his plan is to take her and the baby to Horn Hill. Uh, the quote about him hiring a wagon and some horses and taking her there himself uh, so that he could make certain of the castle and its garrison uh, and, you know, just really be certain that she and the baby are safe. But this is a song of ice and fire where the best laid plans often seem to be mocked by the gods. And who knows what might happen to prevent Sam from doing the things that he plans to do. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. We do know what might happen. Uh, there's an ironborn invasion of the Reach that's happening right now, and that could certainly affect his plans. And considering what he thinks about not leaving her at Horn Hill if he's not satisfied with the defenses, I mean, maybe they go there and he isn't. You know, he's just not satisfied and um, he brings her back to Old Town. And maybe things uh, don't go as well as he planned with his family and he refuses to leave her there. Kind of similar to what happened in the show. Um, if so, I hope he steals the sword. I don't know. Um, <laughs> whether he continues to keep Gilly openly as his companion is debatable, however, because he himself acknowledges that he's a member of not one, but two separate orders that forbid him from having a wife or paramour. So I'm not really sure how he's going to resolve that issue, but I do think that the point is to answer the question directly. Sam is going to keep Gilly safe by keeping her at his side. I don't see them really being separated um, in the way that he kind of thinks is going to happen. Mm. I'm going to go ahead and answer this one with uh, a couple of quotes and honestly, one of my favorite in the books. So this is from, of course, Maester Eamon talking to Jon Snow. Love is the bane of honor, the death of duty. What is honor compared to a woman's love? What is duty against the feel of a newborn son in your arms or the memory of a brother's smile? Wins in words, wins in words. We are only human and the gods have fashioned us for love. That is our great glory and our great tragedy. Now, obviously, as I said, this is a quote from Eamon meant for John, but you can see how this probably is going to apply very soon to Sam, a woman he's in love with, Gilly, a newborn son in his arms, aka monster little Sam, Eamon Steel Song, a brother's smile, perhaps in his younger brother Dickon or John back at the Night's Watch. And now he has two, two vows he may have to break for love. Sam's duty is to the Citadel now to prepare for the others and to help John, but his heart is pulling him in another direction entirely, towards Gilly. Another quote about this. Tell me, John, if the day should ever come when your Lord Father must needs choose between honor on the one hand and those he loves on the other, what would he do? Okay, well, dub in Sam's situation with the Ironborn invasion, his vows to the Citadel versus Gilly. And I think I can agree pretty handily with uh, Lady Gwyn here that I think he'd choose Gilly. Um, it's interesting to note that Sam now finds himself in the exact same scenario as Maester Aemon did when House Targaryen fell. The vows of the Night's Watch and the Citadel on both of them, potential danger befalling not only his found family, but his real one. Aemon did nothing when House Targaryen fell because he was old and blind and couldn't do anything. Sam's none of those things. And But Aemon intimated that if he were younger, he would have become Aemon Targaryen again. He would have become a dragon and chosen his loved ones over the Night's Watch and the Citadel. I think that's a very clever way of George informing us that he's going to challenge Sam's um, honor, his vows versus his love of Gilly and his family. He's going to pull him in a bunch of different directions, exactly like he did to Eamon, except now he's made it possible for the character to do so. Yeah, clever George. And we saw that with Jon Snow as well. Love versus family. We saw that in the Game of Thrones. So we yeah. could see that theme coming back. That would be very interesting. The human heart in conflict with itself, George calls this. Okay, so on to the final question of the day. As Sam enters Old Town, given his new proximity to Horn Hill, thoughts of his overbearing and abusive father, Randall, fill his mind. We get the sense that Sam must confront his demons in order to move on from his past. So our patron, Asha Not Yara, 
asks, how did Randall affect Sam? Is Sam going to have a showdown with his father? And what would that look like? What would be the point character-wise? Joe, take it away. So I think if you had to rate the worst fathers in A Song of Ice and Fire, you don't get very far down that list before Randall the Vandal makes his appearance. Crasser is, of course, at the very top. Tywin probably gets the second spot. And then Randall sneaking in for his bronze medal made of poo. His total denial of Sam's individ individuality and skills, his actual torture of his son, death threats, and even when he sends him away, he refuses to let him, let him become a maester, which would be natural for him, as he certainly has the aptitude for it. It's hard to understate just how damaging that has been for Sam, and that every time he is criticized or called a coward, he recoils probably the same way he did the first time Randall threw those insults at him. And, that, and also that Randall took away from Sam all the people he loved in the world, his sisters, his mother, his little brother. Sam has quite a lot of affection for the rest of House Tarly. Randall took that away, said you cannot have them. If he had joined the Citadel, they would have been in within visiting distance, and Randall couldn't allow that. Sam could not be anywhere near the family ever again. All the progress that Sam has made, unfortunately, has a very real chance of being undone when he faces his primary tormentor. Uh, this was something I know I remembered as I was writing for this. An off-topic example: If you ever watched the King's Speech about um, English England's King George the Sixth struggle with his speech impediment, that formed in childhood from abuse from his household staff, but also the kind of uh, abuse we see from his father, where he was trying his father. Um, actually, Yoke would probably know this. I forget the name of Bertie's father. Do you know what it is? Uh, was he a George? It might have been a George. There's a lot of Georges in a row. But anyway, uh, we see in it's a we see in that movie. story that his father uh, totally berates him in the, much the same way we see from uh, Samuel and Randall, and he tries to fit him into a mold he doesn't fit in. Um, Sam also shows signs of speech impediments early on in the story that gradually go away. Speech impediments are often uh, signs of unresolved childhood abuse, and then. As is explained in the King's speech, but probably also for Sam, every word he stumbles over is kind of a dagger in his heart of every piece of criticism that Randall's ever lo levied at him. Given that George has linked Sam and Tyrion to himself in terms of similarities, and they both have, uh, honestly, dog shit fathers that deserve the flames, there may be an explosive meeting between Sam and Randall coming. Unlikely to be a fatal one, but I don't think there's going to be any arrows coming out of Randall's chest. But perhaps a conversation similar to the ones between Tywin and Tyrion, particularly the one where Tywin admit admitted he wished he had killed Tyrion as a child. I highly doubt Randall's going to be very impressed with his son that he's not only broken his Nightwatch vows, he broke them for Gilly, then joined the Citadel, and then broke those vows implicitly again to come home, a thing he said he would kill him for. I'd prepare for maybe one of the hardest conversations to read in the books, one that's deeply personal. And I, I also really worry about what uh, Randall's going to do with Gilly and her child. He's not going to let House Tarly pass to the child of some wildling born of incest, right? Like, that's not Randall Tarly. So if he tries to leave Gilly and Monster there, I mean, the Ironborn are real danger. But I think Randall's the true danger in this situation. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. It, it's, you know, when you know about Randall and the whole backstory how Sam thinks that this is going to be an acceptable solution, you know, is kind of a mystery. Uh, Randall's pairing parenting has had such a huge impact, negative impact on Sam in so many ways. His cruelty comes out in dozens of small memories. Uh, for me, the pinnacle is if it's chains you want, come with me. Uh, followed by the revelation that Randall chained his son to a wall for three days and nights for the crime of expressing an interest in the Citadel. And as an aside, this wasn't an unusual thing. We've got numerous examples of noble students at the Citadel, uh, from the Targaryens to Oberyn Martell, uh, many, many Tyrells. Uh, not all of them stay to be chained. Uh, they're not necessarily heirs, as Sam was, but Sam could have given up. That would have suited Randall just fine, you know, give up and let his brother inherit and just gone off to be to be a maester which he had the aptitude for like you said so um this this if it's change you want come with me this is a tarly thing a randall tarly thing this is not a cultural thing a westerosi nobility thing 
at all. This is all Randall. So other than that final cruelty of giving him uh, the choice between uh, death and and the wall, uh, you know, and then telling everyone that his heir had died. <laughs> uh, I think this one is the absolute worst. But by the time Sam arrives in Old Town, he's thinking about how he should have run away to the Citadel years ago, which is a far cry from the near panic attack he suffered when John first told him where he was going. I mean, it's so painful in that first Sam chapter to be in his head where he's stammering to John that he can't, he can't wear a chain and he's having these memories of this horrible thing and the things his father said to him and being in the chains and, you know, how they nearly strangled him. He was, you know, every time he fell asleep, um, just horrible. So, you know, in large part, at this point, Sam has overcome that fear and that abuse, but in order for him to truly move beyond it, you think we'd have to see some sort of denouement to the conflict uh, between father and son. But I think we're going to have a huge problem uh, in locations to ov overcome because at least early in the Winds of Winter, it seems like Randall's going to be occupied elsewhere. Uh, he's in King's Landing, and King's Landing <laughs> doesn't look like it's going to be quite peaceful in the <laughs> beginning of the winds of winter. And he does command the army there. So uh, I don't think that he's going to be rushing back to Horn Hill anytime early in the book. So my call is this is something we're going to have to wait for. So uh, in my opinion, how sweet would it be if Sam actually did forge a chain and only after he had forged his chain and is wearing it around his neck, does he finally confront his father either, you know, much later in the book or even potentially not until the next book. Just shows off his bling. Hey, Randall, how's it going? Hey. Yeah. My chain. <laughs> yeah. I, and one of them's Valyrian steel. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. They're all Valyrian steel. All yeah. The way <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So no doubt Sam was, a bookish, awkward, and nerdy soul by nature. But by nurture, Randall worsened Sam's shortcomings. The accounts we have of Randall's cruelty intended to toughen the boy up fall squarely in the abuse category. If Sam was a craven by nature, Randall made it worse by adding trauma to the equation. And so no wonder Sam was a wreck when he first came to the wall. However, Randall was blind to Sam's tremendous talents and try to shape the boy in his own martial image rather than encouraging Sam's interests. I think a showdown of some kind is in the cards in the Winds of Winter, given the proximity between Sam and Hornhill, and the fact that Sam cannot shake off the long shadow cast by his bullying father. This is how he's got to get rid of it, right? We've talked today about Sam's growth and the manhood arc he seems to be on, and if you wanted to point to one big immovable object Sam needs to face to finally overcome his past, it would surely be a show showdown with Randall. I think this potential meeting would be less about Sam proving himself to Randall, something he may never be able to do no matter how hard he tries, and more about Sam finally learning that he doesn't need the approval of an abusive asshole in order to be the man he wants to be. As an aside, I will say that although there's no insinuation of Randall-like abuse, and to sort of retread something that Joe was pointing out earlier, George has said that both his own father never understood his bookishness and that, of course, he relates to Sam. I wonder if this proposed showdown scene might bear thematic interest to George on some level. Overall, if Sam could meet with, with his father and leave with his head held high, perhaps having bested him in some way, it could be the apex of this character development we've been witnessing across many pages. Yeah, to add on to that, the, um, George's father was a longshoreman in New Jersey. If you guys don't know what that is in the chat, that's a guy that unloads and loads boats like 12 hours a day it's hard physical labor and then george was a comic book reading uh nerd that just liked uh, writing his own stories and mm -hmm. living in a world of imagination so it's easy to see how that kind of relationship that's a difference in tastes may have blown up in a young dramatic boy's mind into what we get here 
Yeah, those are great points. Yeah, great points all round. And so that brings to a close today's live stream, but don't go away just yet. I think we might bring the puppy in in a minute. But first of all, I want to say a sincere thank you to Joe Magician. Joe, why don't you tell us all about your YouTube channel, what you're up to, what you've got on your agenda and where to find you, etc. Take it away. Sure. So uh, as I said earlier today, I did my normal uh, Saturday streams, which are on a variety of topics. They're so random. They accidentally all came up today with the faceless men and <laughs> Marwin the mage and all those kind of things. Uh, those are on Saturdays at 2 PM on um, Eastern daylight time. I think that's where I'm now at youtube.com slash Joe magician. I also produce uh, theory videos and analysis for my channel. My latest one's about the possibility that, Lady Stoneheart may be trying to resurrect her long lost son, Rob Stark. Um, those kind of things, a lot of tinfoil, just, just a lot of uh, fun, good stuff. Um, upcoming, I'm going to be releasing for patrons. The We're going to be doing a read through of George R. Martin's first novel, Dying of the Light. I'll be releasing that in the next few days, the first episode of that. Uh, as for upcoming projects, um, I can't talk about the first one because it's super secret and it's going to be amazing. But the second one will be about a comparison uh, between Daenerys Targaryen and Stannis Baratheon and how George is using one to tell the story about e the other. Um, after that, I have a long list of theories and stuff like that to do. Um, I will probably never run out of content as well as um, taking more interest in House of the Dragon as that gets closer. Um, but yeah, those are all the things <laughs> all the things i talk about i don't even know what next week's um stream is going to be about we'll figure it out as we get closer i don't i don't have the same kind of um what's the right word um principled nature that other podcasts and youtube channels have <gasps> it's tessie <laughs> oh what a sweet girl This is our puppy, Tessie. She's a, a husky shepherd mix, and perhaps there's a few other breeds in there somewhere. <laughs> She's uh, like no no puppy we've seen before. She's uh, very well behaved and polite, five months old, and we have had her about a week and a half. And, yeah, she's one of the family now. We've got two cats, one dog. <laughs> She's got these be beautiful eyes, mismatched, just like Shiera Seastar, one oh. green and one blue. She has uh, big floppy ears like Shiera, too. Oh, yeah. We're not sure if they're <laughs> going to stand up or um, fold Ooh. over. But, yeah, there's German Tessie. <laughs> nice to introduce our new pet, new puppy. <laughs> so... As as what what's for next uh, next for Radio Westeros? We're working on more content. We're going to do um, a primer all about what's going on in Marine. We've just released one about Slavers Bay, so go and check that out if you haven't already. And the next one will be inside Marine. So we've also got more live streams to come. We're aware we haven't done one for Aaron, Victorion, and we got. Tyrion and we'll make our way through Barristan and Daenerys, all the POVs we haven't done, we're, we're going to complete the series of POVs guys, so we're, we're not going to stop until we've done that and thanks to all your support of the live stream so far, there will be more and a special shout out to all of our Discord mods and our chat room mods you guys do such a great job, thank you so much for everything you do Thanks to each and every one of our patrons who support us. If you want to support us as a patron too, check out our Patreon campaign, which includes all manner of incentives, including shout outs and early releases. And most of all, we hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks so much for tuning in and bye for now. <laughs>